Welcome back. We've been working real hard on the rivet press and we're gonna show you all the nitty gritty of that for this video. But so many of you have been freaking out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook in the comments section about the uh, fasteners for the backbone and the uh, screws that we use for attaching the frames. So we figured before we dive into the rivet press, we should uh, go over those fasteners a little bit and maybe quell some of these fears that many of you seem to be possessing right now. In the last episode, we took these big old bronze screws and we fastened our frames into the sockets and the keel timber. Uh, and we had a lot of people voice some real concerns about those. Um, so we wanted to try to quell some of those concerns. One, these screws got countersunk a little bit into the frame. And you can see there's over an inch and a half of screw that is going into the keel timber. So that's a pretty decent amount of fastening for what we're using these for. And these screws are not going to be the only thing that connects the frames to the keel timber. They're just a small part of that assembly. Um, and this is a thing that a lot of boat builders actually don't even do. They skip it. They just end the frames right on top of the keel timber. And it's actually the floor timbers that carry that load. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, these screws are basically bonus fasteners. And if you add them all up, saying each screw maybe holds 100 pounds, uh, that's still many, many tons of extra carrying you know, capacity that we have for those fastenings that are basically bonus. Because in reality, the floor timbers are actually what does all that work. So what is a floor timber? A floor timber is a connection member in the boat that joins the frame with the center line structure, either the stem, the stern, or the keel timber, with the frame on the opposite side. And every single set of frames in the boat will get a floor timber. And the point of that floor timber is to really transfer the load from the keel and the ballast keel into these frames. Because if you can imagine, we have all that weight in the bottom and all of the water, the buoyancy, pushing up on the hull. And where that wants to separate is right at this line where the frames meet the keel. And these frames, the ends of them, are really what ends up holding up that ballast keel. And a lot of you are concerned that all that was going to be holding that was those little bronze screws that we put in. In reality, we get this big, beefy floor timber that goes through here. So these strings right now are set up at the height, or just below the height of the floor inside of the boat. And anything below the floor here is called the bilge. And down here in the bilge is where you put the floor timbers. And they can be cast out of metal, they can be a solid piece of wood, they can be laminated out of wood, they can be a combination of wood and metal. There's a ton of different ways to do floor timbers. We'll dive into all of that later. But suffice it to say, they attach very firmly to the frames on each side, and they attach very firmly to the keel timber, the stem, and the stern. And those are what really carry all that load. And that's why we say, once the floors are in, you could take a sawzall and just cut all of these frames right where they meet the keel timber and go sail around the world and she would be perfectly strong. Not as strong as if they're socketed and screwed, because you know those are extra fasteners, that's extra contact point, but plenty of boat builders build boats without notching the frames and they do just fine. Um, so no need to worry about those screws, they're basically just an added bonus and the floor timbers are really gonna carry that weight. And when we put in the floor timbers, we'll also drill the rest of the ballast keel bolts so that those bolts go right through the floor timbers and directly connect these frames with the ballast keel and the keel timber in a very solid manner so that when we huck this puppy off some big waves and some seas, we're not gonna have any worries. Now hopefully we're less concerned that these aren't the only things holding up the boat when we're out on the seven seas. Um, we also wanted to cover a little bit, people are concerned that these seem to go in too easily uh, and they should go in easily. And we're gonna talk here a little bit about why. So if you look at this screw here, we'll notice a couple things. One, there aren't threads way up the top here. Two, the threads up here are much shallower than they are down here. The screw itself is straight. We make contact all down the shank and all down the threads. But if you look, you'll see that the center, the root kind of, of the screw is actually tapered. And that's why we have deeper threads on this end and shallower threads on this end. And that is why we use a tapered drill bit that is specifically made to match that center taper. Now we finally got the longer drill bits in and they have the countersink for them. So the screw ends up sitting roughly about there. 
and this bit here cuts the countersink for that. You want the shank here to be about the same diameter as the screw, ever so slightly smaller. And then you wanna make sure that the screw down at the end where it's engaging into the other piece of timber, that you're drilling the hole the same diameter as that center shank, as that center root, but that you are not drilling where these threads are. So ideally, the only thing that this screw is cutting when it goes in is this little bit where all of these threads bite. And if we put the screw underneath, you can actually see that we have the bit set so that the screw's a little bit longer than the drill bit. So this end ends up poking into the wood on its own accord. And that all of these fins, the screw that actually bites, sticks out farther than the drill shank. So these are very important. When you get this right, the screw should just go in very easily because um, all you're doing is cutting these little teeth in. So I just mentioned that when we put these screws in, we want the piece that we're screwing through to be able to be a slip fit to slide on the screw. And we're gonna demonstrate why that is and why that's so important. And to do that, we're gonna use this bolt and these couple nuts. So we're gonna use this bolt to demonstrate and the threads on this bolt are exactly the same principle as the threads on this screw. And these nuts, they basically represent our pieces of wood. So if we had one piece of wood that we're screwing into, and we have another piece of wood that we're screwing through, so this one is joining that one, and those two pieces of wood aren't tight up against each other, and we take our screw, and we start to put it in the first one, what happens is if those screws are engaged in the first one, it'll go through, and we'll hit the second one, and what happens is this screw is cutting threads into the two pieces of wood. So these two pieces of wood are both threaded, they're both engaged with the screw, and no matter how long or how tight I try to get this, to get these two to come together, we have to shear out those threads in one of these two pieces so that they'll pull together. And obviously if we shear them out of this one, they're not. Um, so that's why we want that slip fit. So in comparison, take this out and we drill a little bit bigger hole through that first piece so that the screw can slip and we slide it in and we start tightening it up in the inside. Remember these screws, these threads are cutting into this piece. This one's now fixed. And as we tighten it up, we're eventually gonna close that distance. And the head of the screw here is gonna fetch up on that outer one and we're gonna be able to tighten it down and they're gonna join. Um, and that is why you want that slip fit on that outer piece. And they call this thread bound when two pieces are out from each other and the threads in that bolt or threads in that screw are uh, stopping them from coming together. So now let's do this on two pieces of wood and show you what we're talking about in real life. So we take our drill and our countersink. And this is one of our frames that didn't make the cut because it got a split in it. Okay, so now what we're looking for, now that we have that hole in that countersink done, is a slip fit. That screw should just pop right in. And as you can see, it's still pretty snug. It's a tight fit in there, but it does slide. And that is what we were looking for. So now we can put our two pieces of wood together. We can drill that lead hole into the next one. Can't forget the wax. The wax really does make them go in and out a lot easier. So as we mentioned, we're using toilet bowl wax to lube, and apparently this is not a common thing around the world. So here in the United States, a lot of toilets are sealed down to the pipe, I guess, with a wax ring, and that's what we use. And we use new wax, not used wax, because that would be kind of gross. Um, and some of you have commented how about how old toilet bowl wax is made with beeswax and would last a lot longer. And although this is a petroleum product and some of you claim that it's gonna break down in time, honestly, we're not too worried about it. The main point is to really is to lube those screws going in and the amount of water or anything that's ever gonna get in there is so minimal that if the wax does degrade over time, it's really not a big deal. So we'll put the screw in, we'll line up our hole. And as you can see, it's not tight. You can grab the bit and brace here. and we can start to drive it home. And we can see that's caught, and we have a pretty big gap there. And 
Now, that's nice and tight. So that's attached now, and that is exactly how we attached the frames to the keel timber. Um, the frames on the keel timber, these holes will eventually just get painted over and covered in bedding compound, and then the first plank will cover them up. So we're not gonna bother bunging them. A Bunch of people question that as well. So the last fear that we hope to kind of put to bed here is over our fin head bolts. And we made a few of these for the backbone assembly. There's a couple in the stem, there's a couple in the stern. So they are not ballast keel bolts. Anyone saying that is misinformed. Um, but anyways, we're gonna see if we can break this, crush some wood, see what happens. So we got a short fin head bolt that we knocked up here. And actually, I wanna go the other way. Okay, so first of all, when we put the bolts in, they are all a driven fit like that, and the longer they are, the harder you have to drive them. And they're all driven at different angles. So even if you went through the boat and took off all the heads of all the bolts and left the rods in place, I think you would really, really, really struggle to pull that backbone apart. So that's point number one. Now we're gonna hop on here. And we got a steel nut and a steel washer because I want the limiting factor to be that fin head on the bottom. And we're going to snug them up. And that's it. She's not going anymore. And that fin head is starting to crush the timbers, but so far it looks perfectly flat. So that's about it for the impact gun. Uh, if we keep going, it will just ever so slowly keep rotating it around for a little while longer. But one, we're just gonna smoke the batteries doing it this way. Two, I'm gonna go deaf doing it this way. And three, we're probably really gonna piss off the neighbors because the noise from these puppies carries real far. I'll throw the breaker bar on there and see what gives first. Now it's starting to deform. But holy smokes, is that a lot of force. Now well, the fins are folding back, but... Oh, <laughs> what? Trying to keep going? <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a bigger <laughs> bar. <laughs> So I popped the fin head. And folks are right. The fin head is not as strong as two nuts on either end would have been. But I will tell you, this thing crushed into the oak. It deformed like crazy. And we had to haul it like a good half of an inch into the oak and deform it that far before that head popped. There's no way on earth the backbone timbers are ever gonna get pulled that far apart to be able to do that. And there's so many other bolts in there and they're all at different angles. I'm not worried about it at all. I wouldn't hang the ballast keel off them, that's for sure. But for the couple that we have in the stem and the stern, I think they're completely fine. So let's pound this out and see what the rest of it looks like. So you can see how far that sunk in. There you go, the head sheared right off. But it had to travel a significant distance and took an incredible amount of force. More force and more distance than these backbone timbers are ever gonna take. If it actually manages to do that, it's gonna have ripped the planking from the stem and the stern and all sorts of other horrible things have already gonna have happened. So I think the handful of these we have, I am totally comfortable with them. Some may be, some other folks may not be comfortable with them, but I don't know. I don't see these ever going anywhere. Now that we've talked about the screws and the fin head bolts, let's go on to the next fastener, which is gonna be the copper rivets for the planking. So this is the largest commercial available rivet we could find, and this is our homemade version. So let's go into how we uh, took a bunch of stock and made these. 
So looking at the uh, split frames here, this is the frame of the boat, and then this board here is a planking facsimile. It's the same thickness as our planking. So if we were to screw the planking to the frames, we would use a screw similar to this, although a bit longer. And we would countersink it into the planking a bit so we can put a wood plug, a bung over it. And we would make it so that the screws are just shy of poking through the inside of the frame. And one of the potential issues with this is that both sides of the frame end up on the threads and it can get thread bound, which we talked about earlier. So what we decided to do was use rivets. And this is the largest commercial available rivet that we were able to find. And we hunted high and low for a while. So the rivet would do the same thing. You'd countersink it a little bit and it would go right through the planking, right through the frame. And on the other side, you would put a conical washer called a rove. And this basically makes a through bolt. You would cut the rivet on the inside, peen it over with a hammer, and it basically makes a through bolt. So largest commercial rivet, and then acorn to Arabella rivet. So they're much bigger and they are square. So what we ended up doing was buying copper stock, quarter inch by quarter inch by 12 foot long lengths, and forming it into our own rivets. So these rivets will get countersunk through. They'll get driven through a quarter inch round hole so that all of these corners will bite in really well. And then we'll put the rove, we'll get peened over on the other side. And these will make really great, really strong planking rivets. And the nice thing about the square rivet is that they're all gonna go in at a little bit of a different angle. So no matter how the plank or the frame is really being loaded, you're gonna be trying to bend some of these rivets along their long axis, which is stronger than a round rivet. And also by driving a square rivet into a round hole, it's gonna lock itself in there really, really tight. Um, so we can make these rivets for thousands of dollars less than we can buy these smaller rivets. And as you can see, they are much bigger and it would be much stronger and cheaper. So we hunted high and low for a rivet manufacturer and these are the biggest things we could come up with. So, and they're expensive. So we ended up deciding to make our own. So we started by purchasing 12 foot lengths of quarter inch square stock that looked like this. And one of our volunteers, thank you, Odie, uh, cut a lot of it to length for us. Once it was cut to length, we had one of our local machinist guys who's been helping us a lot, Joe. He built us this die that we can put in a press and then we can press a head on them. And then once the heads are pressed, we can put them on the grinder with a jig that Odie made, thanks again, Odie, uh, and put a point on them. And that is our final rivet. And we even took one and did a torture test with it. So we riveted two pieces of oak and ripped it all apart. And as you can see, it bent and it deformed, but it did not break. Um, so we are very happy with the outcome. So we needed a way to turn square stock into these rivets. And this is our solution. Uh, so our machinist friend Joe helped us out yet again and machined this die. So there's a cap that sits over the top and that guides the pins that come down. Otherwise we found that the rivets would just fall over. So that fits over the top. And then the die opens up. And you can see there's just machine slots with the shape of the head. So you can load your rivets in. Put the nuts on, tighten it down, throw the cap on, and then when you press it, the rod can't fall over anywhere, and it forms out in mushrooms and becomes our head. One of the issues we had is we originally just had these two points down here, and the top of the die would actually bend and it would bow out. Um, so the cap would end up getting wedged, and you'd have to like beat the cap to get the cap off, which is not ideal. Uh, and it was also making it so that the rivets didn't form completely even. So we brought it back to Joe and he drilled two more holes. So we got to put in the two bolts and tack weld those in the back, reaffix this in our jig with the 32 ton press and give it a crack. But fingers crossed, I think we're just about there to having a functioning rivet machine. So this is what we ended up making for a rivet press. Um, 
And since a bunch of this video is uh, kind of talking to and reacting to the comments that people have on YouTube and Instagram and whatnot, I'm gonna beat you to this one and say that these welds are ugly and that I'm not a very good welder. And this I know, so no need to point it out. <laughs> um, but I am a woodworker and I'm a woodworker that can do metalworking well enough to get the job done. And that's what this case is. So for the rivet press, we started with a 20 ton press that we bought and we immediately bent it and rendered it useless. So in true Acorn to Arabella fashion, we went to the metal yard and built our own. Um, so we got some big channel iron here for the sides. We got a big chunk of I-beam for the top and the bottom. We picked up a 32 ton air actuated hydraulic press. So you just press the button and the air compressor runs it so you don't have to sit there and crank a lever. We built a cage for the die to sit into. Joe built the die for us. And then there's the pins underneath. So once everything's loaded up, you press the button, the jack goes down, the pins go into the holes and it crushes some rivets for us. So we're gonna weld in these last couple bolts that Joe drilled the holes for us and put it in and take it for a test drive. But hopefully we are about at the point where we have a functioning rivet machine. Operational. All right, so we're all loaded up. Look awesome. Yeah, I'm psyched. Cold pressed rivets. <laughs> I think we have a working rivet press. So we are super psyched. We just made a whole bunch of rivets, it did it all without any hiccups. I think we are in production. Uh, it is definitely not the fastest machine in the world, but so far it has proved to be very reliable. It is very simple. And the idea behind it is that we have so many volunteers that we can put them to work making rivets. And if it's a slow, steady, simple machine like that, we can park somebody behind it and say, go to town. Uh, so we'll get that figured out in the not too distant future. And I'm sure that a ton of you have various ideas of how we could do this better, faster, more efficiently, and we would love to see them. So our challenge to you is to go build a rivet machine, upload it to YouTube, send us the link, and if it is better than this one and more efficient, we will either buy it from you or we will build one. Um, but for right now, I think we are happy with what we got and uh, we only need to run the machine about a thousand times to make our 4,000 rivets and we can do a batch of four in about five minutes. So if you do the math, it really ain't too shabby. So mission accomplished.
usually it's just Alex and I out here like figuring shit out, reading books, watching YouTube videos, uh, figuring out what best to do. But when it came to this rivet machine, we had a lot of help. So we really want to thank those folks that gave us a hand with that. Um, big thanks to Satchel for helping us like brainstorm this rig to begin with. Joe for doing all the machining on the die and helping us figure that out. Gene for helping do the last bit of the welding and like the fiddly setup with that. And Odie for cutting a lion's share of our rivet stock so that we can uh, get into rivet production. And there might be a few more that have helped out. If so, we're really sorry. This has been a long kind of torrid process getting this thing set up. But thank you to everyone who helped out. We really appreciate it and are psyched to be in rivet production.